I'm Emily Jashinsky. I'm Josh Hammer. I'm Rachel oh. Bovard. And I'm Ben Weingarten. And this is NatCon Squad, where common sense and common good meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Make sure to subscribe now on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving week. We are going to talk today, starting with Rachel, about Microsoft's Activision takeover, which has all kinds of implications uh, for our economy. We're talking about with Josh, the Supreme Court's major First Amendment case that is coming up up. We're talking about Elon Musk and Twitter. Ben is going to break down some new developments and on that front and all the unrest in China, I will try to break down as well. So with that, let's kick it over to Rachel. So there was recently announced a bid by Microsoft, uh, which everyone remembers as the 1990s era antitrust villain. Uh, they are going to attempt to buy uh, Activision Blizzard, which is the uh, video game studio that owns majorly popular uh, video game franchises like Call of Duty, uh, World of Warcraft, Candy Crush. Um, and if the bill, if the merger goes through, the all cash $69 billion deal will be the biggest uh, tech merger uh, in the history of the tech industry, as far as I can tell. And, you know, this, I think, presents some interesting questions for people on the right, like me, who watch a lot of the antitrust action. Um, there are traditional antitrust concerns with this merger, and as such, the FTC looks like they will be announcing that they are going to take a second look at it. Um, among the concerns is one of what's called vertical foreclosure, the idea that um, Microsoft, in taking ownership of the video game franchise, franchise, specifically Call of Duty, will make it exclusive to Xbox. And this will put it in a difficult position with Sony who makes PlayStation, which is the right now number one console in the world. If you take away a very popular video game, video game franchise or even limit it, you know, not even completely just diminish access to it, you're basically making an anti-competitive move to move consumers off competitor platforms to your own. So that's called a vertical foreclosure. It's, a, it's a, again, a very traditional antitrust concern. However, in a piece that I have out today um, at The Spectator, you know, I make the case that, you know, there, a lot of the antitrust energy on the right has been focused naturally on the big tech platforms. And, you know, that's been well and good. But I think to be, you know, consistent and intellectually rigorous on this point, the right has to look outward um, and begin to engage in scrutiny on deals like this, right? Not this particular merger doesn't present the same kind of speech concerns, at least on its face. Uh, that you see with a lot of the sort of mergers and acquisitions that you know in the big tech space. I'm thinking of Facebook and Google in particular, but it does, I think, raise a lot of the issues of of cult that cultural consolidation brings. And this is often my case for why I think the right needs to be more critical of antitrust because corporate consolidation, especially now when a lot of America's major cult uh, you know corporations are arrayed against the right. Corporate consolidation has cultural outcomes. And I've made this case when it comes to speech, right? That speech is downstream of a lot of the corporate consolidation that exists in the big tech space. But even here with Microsoft, outside of even the traditional antitrust concerns, you have a company that is just extremely cozy with China, right? And if we now are looking at Microsoft, who is has created a censored search engine for China, has platform dissidents at the Chinese requests, if they are now taking over the major vectors of video games in the United States, what are they going to do in terms of, you know, acquiescing to China on that front? So how are we going to see cultural considerations arrayed uh, in, the, in the gaming industry? But I think, you know, Microsoft is not a, a one-off in this area. In the piece, I make the case that, like, look at the banking industry. Look at what con consolidation in the banking industry is wrought in the sense that you now see the banking industry um, moving against people, uh, ideological dissidents, right? Debanking is now something we are actually talking about and seeing in our mainstream lives, which is just absolutely insane to me. But that, again, is the result of a lot of uh, consolidation that's gone on in that sector. The right cannot always go back to its favorite fallbacks in this scenario, which is boycott something or build your own platform. If in this case, you have such consolidation across the sector that you really can't go anywhere else, number one, or two, the alternatives that you want to build can actually gain investment capital or gain any traction because the sector itself is so dominant. So when we talk of, you know, when I talk about the Microsoft Activision merger in this piece, it's really a jumping off point for why I think the right has to get serious about enforcing our antitrust laws as a means of survival as a 
as we are now sort of dissidents against the culture, we have to be more critical in this area. So I throw it open, you know, there's a, a lot of different areas to go with this, but that's, that's my take in this piece. No, I think it's an extremely good point. And it's one that I worry we, we discuss so much in spaces like these that it doesn't trickle into the official sort of Republican Party agenda. Because if you look at, uh, let's say, the, the approach that some Republicans, elected Republicans, have taken to Jonathan Cantor and Lena Khan, which do have dramatic disagreements with the right on a number of issues, uh, those treatments reflect, I think, a lack of understanding of why this common cause is essential um, and, and why you should be stacking for instance, places, uh, you know, you, you should be stacking the administrative state with people like Lena Khan to the extent that it's possible um, because that common cause is so important. The, the consolidation um, has, has really allowed for the monopolization of speech. Like if, if Facebook hadn't snatched up Instagram um, and all kinds of other things, and if uh, you hadn't seen the same with Google and YouTube, we may never have had cancel culture on the level that we did for, for several years in the way that we still do and in ways that are, are severely harming our politics and people's lives. Uh, you always have to go back to the example of how, you know, there was this Katie Herzog expose of Barry Weiss's Substack about 18 months ago in the medical industry and how few people want to do research, life-saving research, um, and how hard it is to defend life-saving things like having police in emergency rooms um, in the atmosphere like this. And a lot of that happened because of this. It's not just a right-left issue. It's about having a, a healthy marketplace of ideas, not just a healthy marketplace, but a healthy marketplace of ideas. Um, and both of those things go hand in hand. And so the, the sort of necessity of genuinely embedding this kind of ferocious um, guarding, tending to the, the garden of the free market and, and trimming the weeds of monopolies. There's nothing anti-conservative about, anti about it at all whatsoever. Um, and it needs to go just from big tech to all of these other, I mean, I guess Microsoft is a tech company, um, but it needs to go from just the social media companies that we all think of, Facebook, whatever else. Um, it, and it needs to become a broader part of this conversation. It needs to be in the meatpacking industry. It needs to be sort of like across the board adopted into the Republican agenda. And what worries me is, is really, I know it, it's a huge frustration of Matt Stoller's. He still says, you know, the, the real anti-monopolists are in the Democratic Party. If you look at how these, these votes go, um, and I think sadly he's right. I don't know that that's necessarily always going to be the case, but it does show how urgently we need a change of attitude. I think in elected Republicans, we're going to need to swallow a hard pill and start uh, backing some folks, making common cause with people like Lena Khan. Well, I mean, a lot of folks on the right side of the aisle, you know, explicitly and, and even in some cases emphatically supported Lena Khan to be the FTC commissioner. So, you know, our friend Mike Davis, the head of the Internet Accountability Project, where I, I volunteer on the side and I, where I believe Rachel was instrumental in helping found the organization. You know, Mike's group, IAP, was very out and vocal in support of Lena Khan. I think the final Senate confirmation tally, if I recall, was roughly 68 or 69 senators. So, you know, fewer than 20 Republican senators supported her, but that's still a pretty high number, right? especially for Lena Khan, who, you know, is by her own admission, a very progressive woman. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't make, uh, you know, like-minded cause with her on the antitrust issue, at least to a prudential ex extent. I, I publicly also supported her confirmation. And, um, you know, I, I very much agree with kind of the thrust of what Rachel and Emily have said on this. The idea that kind of the right's broader rethinking of antitrust, the notion that this was only kind of a big tech specific thing, it really never made a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, the, the big tech platforms and we, you know social media in particular, um, you know, Google, Amazon, the Amazon marketplace, Google search algorithms, Facebook, Meta, and Twitter. I mean, you know, they are controlling the channels, instrumentalities of speech and commerce. But debanking, frankly, which Rachel alluded to, debanking, frankly, terrifies me orders of magnitude more. <laughs> Than the then the big tech stuff terrifies me, and big tech terrifies me quite a bit. But uh, the notion that um, you know J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, can, or, or or so forth, Merrill Lynch, whoever can just cut off your access to lines of credit. I mean, talk about an easy way to subjugate and dehumanize half of the population, right? 
Um, you know, I, I spoke about this actually in a, in a recent speech turned into an essay for Claremont. Uh, it's over at the American Mind site. Um, and, you know, my my ba- this is not going to be a surprise to listeners and viewers of this podcast, but my 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 basic solution to this is to be, um, you know, a little, little more liberal, for lack of a better term, with a prudential application of both antitrust and common carrier regulation as a specific uh, choice of industry uh, makes sense for a particular remedy. But, um, you know, I want to give Ben time in the segment as well here. I'm kind of rambling. Yeah, so I would just say I think that Rachel's point about the cultural power aspect of this is very well taken. And just as a broad sort of way, I think how we should think about antitrust and similar remedies going forward is that the more concentrated power that you have in any particular sector, but of course, particularly in the most influential, powerful ones, the greater tools of influence, coercion and co-option, by the way, Uh, not only by our own leaders, but of course, by foreign regimes as well, those opportunities open themselves up. And that poses an existential threat ultimately Mm -hmm. to our Republican order. And so, of course, then we should not be bashful about potentially raising the tools of antitrust and other regulatory tools as well. I'd also say just from the business's perspective, it would make sense to some extent that businesses would advocate, of course, for consolidation because that gives them a stronger market position. But also, this creates an opportunity for greater regulatory power slash oversight over them by government officials who want to use corporations to do their bidding. So there's a deal on both sides here when you have consolidation in an industry that I think ultimately not only just hurts consumers, but hurts the republic itself. And I'm not inherently anti-mergers and acquisitions per se. I say that as someone who used to work in investment banking alongside M&A bankers. But that said, the opportunities for abuse and corruption when you have concentrated power are always there. And in particular, in the most hyper-regulated sectors, including, by the way, the banking and insurance sectors. Last but not least, I think this is a real test of how serious the Biden administration was when it put Lenacon in this position. Was it simply to mollify uh, some of the critics of corporatism and crony capitalism writ large, um, or was it or was it window dressing? And we'll see. This is a good uh, case study in how serious the administration was with the con pick. All okay, right. so let's. Oh, uh, it's okay, all you got. Say, okay, yeah. No, sorry, I was trying to transition to myself here for another kind of legal adjacent topic. So there's a major Supreme Court case that will be heard next Monday, December fifth. For what my money is worth, this is the case that I am probably paying second closest attention to of all the cases this term after the marquee affirmative action cases that we discussed on this show previously. Um, The affirmative action case is just to kind of reset the scene and set the table just real, really briefly here. There's litigation out of both Harvard University and University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And this really is the court's most straightforward and direct opportunity to end the systemic racism of of affirmative action, uh, really, since they kind of uh, mealy mouthedly, you might say, upheld the the affirmative action structure in a case called Rudder in 2003. I'm cautiously optimistic they will do so. The other kind of massive constitutional case that I think many are paying attention to, properly speaking, is this case that we're going to talk about here. It's out of Colorado. It's a case called 303 Creative. Um, It's basically a variety of the the so-called bake the damn cake bigot style of cases, which um, if you think that we've had far too many of these cases, you are not wrong. That is kind of the entire purpose of this case, actually, is that I think we finally have a chance to once and for all kind of have a definitive ruling that stops the ridiculous litigation on the suing of people like Jack Phillips, a masterpiece cake shop. And, you know, if you recall, if we go back a few years, a Masterpiece Cake Shop was a case also out of Colorado. I'm not, not entirely sure what's going on there um, in the centennial state exactly when it comes to these these variety of cases, perhaps it's something to do with the ubiquity of legal marijuana there. I wouldn't I, I, I wouldn't really know. I'm not a dabbler myself. But, you know, so Jack Phillips had had this litigation in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. And. In 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court had an opportunity to issue, I think, a broad definitive ruling when it comes to the intersection of anti-discrimination law and kind of the LGBT rights movement in particular and um, religious liberty and free speech rights. On the other hand, 
And it infamously declined to do so in a, in a very kind of extremely narrow, procedural heavy 7 2 opinion. It was actually the final opinion written by Justice Anthony Kennedy before he retired at the end of that term, paving the way for Brett Kavanaugh. They basically found a procedural way out where the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was himself or herself bigoted in terms of kind of expressing anti Christian animus. So it was basically kicked down. The mere fact, from my perspective, that the court has granted cert and agreed to hear the 303 creative case just a handful of years after the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, especially when you, when you consider the personnel changes on the court since Masterpiece Cake Shop, that referring specifically uh, most dramatically to Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. I am, I am optimistic that we actually might get a final ruling here. And 303 Creative, um, I probably should have kind of said the very basic fact pattern here. So Lori Smith is the new Jack Phillips. Lori Smith um, does not actually bake cakes, but she designs websites. She is a wedding or website kind of graphic designer of sorts. Similar story, you know, she doesn't want to uh, design graphics for same-sex weddings. It violates her, her, her conscience. Interestingly, this case is not being litigated at all as a free exercise clause or RIFRA or anything within the realm of religious liberty litigation. It's being litigated explicitly as a free speech case, actually. And the basic argument is that no kind of state-level anti-discrimination statutes such as Colorado's can compel, can coerce Lori Smith um, to speak. Um, and, and and especially to kind of speak in a way, um, you know, that violates something that she would not otherwise say. There's there's a history of Supreme Court opinions that would seem to indicate that Laurie Smith has a very good shot here. Uh, Ilya Shapiro of the Manhattan Institute has an op-ed at Newsweek out uh, this week that I would encourage the listening viewers to look at. He kind of cites some of these arguments, one of which was a case out of the state of New Hampshire decades ago where someone objected to the live free or die message in New Hampshire and did not want to put that license plate on his car. And the Supreme Court basically said that it's true the government cannot compel you to, to, to show this particular strand of speech there. So I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, especially given the current composition of the court, that we might actually finally, finally get a broader ruling as pertains to the kind of thorny intersection of anti-discrimination law and free speech rights. It's probably clever that this was not litigated as a free exercise re religious liberty case. I do personally hope that we also get a similar ruling when it comes um, to the infamous Employment Division versus Smith case from 1990 and, re and Religious Liberty and Free Exercise, perhaps in a future case here. But we'll see. And, you know, in this particular case out of the Tenth Circuit, it, it came out two to one the wrong way. It was a pretty egregious decision, as Ilya kind of dissects in, in this op-ed he wrote for Newsweek. But there was a powerful dissent by probably the lone stalwart conservative, I would say, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, who was Judge Timothy Timkovich. He wrote a really nice dissenting opinion that it's very easy to foresee could be kind of the roadmap for a 5-4-6-3, um, dare I say 7-2, but probably some sort of like 6-3 um, majority opinion. Um, I, I'll kind of throw it open to you guys on, on this note. Um, I, th th this is a big case from, from, from my vantage point here. I think we, I, I'm cautiously optimistic if, if, if you have been able to pick up on that. So I guess my kind of question to you guys is like, are you similarly optimistic about this or am I getting a little too ahead of myself here? Well, I think some of the, parallels between what you're discussing now and what we discussed last week in terms of what the Senate's about to do are kind of striking because I think the point you know that you made early on which is that these cases keep coming to the Supreme Court where people are either being you know traditionally under the veil of religious liberty where people are trying to like make their religious views known but in this case under speech you know similar concerns but under the banner of coercive speech we keep seeing this trend in society of you know people persecuting for lack of a better word or using the legal mechanisms to harass people who are cultural dissidents on various fronts and you know last week we talked about the senate which is still considering the respect for marriage act a bill that says it codifies gay marriage but it actually does nothing of the sort right it actually doesn't change anything from what from what obergefell did but what it does do is create exactly the climate that this case is purporting at least right. to deal with it to some respect which is it creates a complete avenue for legal harassment of anyone who has traditional views of marriage. And so I guess, you know, I don't, this, you know, maybe Josh, you're right to be optimistic in the sense that this bill will finally start to shut down this growing trend toward this idea that, you know, we have religious liberty in America, but, but having religious liberty in America just means you're stuck in perpetual litigation designed exclusively to persecute and bankrupt you. Um, that is not religious liberty. And so if this case goes toward at least ending that phenomenon, I think it could be a helpful step because 
I can't imagine, you know, the the founders or really anyone working on religious liberty issues or spe free speech issues imagined we'd be in a situation now where, you know, hope you have enough money to, it's the David French approach, right? Just sue, you're fine. <laughs> it's not sustainable citizenship in America. <laughs> So I think that the paradigm that you're describing there, Rachel, it really illustrates something that I've argued before, which is that the state religion effectively is wokeism, and it is being imposed from virtually every single institution, public and private in the country that holds any power and cultural influence besides the Supreme Court. And, and that is why, hence, I think this massive campaign to delegitimize the Supreme Court to look at all the different ways uh, it can be expanded, diluted, watered down. Um, you know, the the notion of basically destroying it to the extent it ever deigns to rule in a way that conflicts with the state religion. And I think, by the way, when the left talks about the Supreme Court being totally out of step with uh, where the left is and its institutions are, I think that is accurate. I think that's actually genuine. Although, to be fair, the Supreme Court is still going to rule in ways uh, that you know we loathe, I'm sure, on any number of issues going forward. But on certain ones, or on anyone, I guess, from the perspective of the left, where the court does not take the progressive stand and actually seeks to restore a modicum of balance between the state anti-religion of wokeism and the religion's that the court is supposed to protect, uh, that you're going to have this continued onslaught against it. So I hold a, a, you know, a modicum of optimism like Josh, and we'll see what the rationale is ultimately in how the court rules. But I think, you know, there's going to be, a, there's a broader war that's at play here and it predates Dobbs, of course. And it goes to obviously going back to Bork for that matter, and maybe even before Robert Bork, that to the extent there's any pillar, let alone pillars on the Supreme Court, of anything resembling an anti-progressive ideology, the court has to be stopped. And I think you're only going to see the cause for attacking the legitimacy of the court, but then also nullification, I think, going forward, increase to the extent this court does rule, as the composition would suggest, in any number of important cases going forward. Well, I'm not a a lawyer like Ben. No, I'm kidding. That's a little inside uh, joke about one time I thought Ben was a lawyer. Uh, it turns out he's not. I will say, though, that I've had the opportunity to talk with Lori. Um, and what's striking is how normal people have gotten wrapped up in these sagas. Um, and, and just from the conversation that I had with her, it was really very sad to me that some person who's just trying to run their business ended up, you know, ADF is great. Um, and I'm sure ADF would share the sentiment that we wish so many people wouldn't have to work with ADF uh, because it means that their life and their rights in some ways are being infringed upon. Um, and you know, just to just to see a, a normal person going about their everyday lives, trying to own a business, operate a business as a Christian, um, and, and finding that to be difficult to do to the point where it has to become a legal challenge. Challenge, uh, you know, I, I think we all kind of hoped that you know we were we were past that as a country that we had sort of uh, crossed the we, we had crested um, and we had you know fought for equal rights and and civil rights in all of these different ways um, and in ways in which it was long overdue. But uh, this this is one where we're we're regressing and it's actually hurting regular people. So she's she's brave for stepping into this arena. And on that note, I'll toss it to you, Ben. Yeah. So I don't think we've actually really had a lengthy conversation yet about the moves that Elon Musk has made since taking over Twitter. And I think they merit discussion, particularly as there seems to be an escalating war against him now. And there's been a war, of course, against Musk from the time it appeared that he might actually be interested in the platform. But now we see what I think is something, and it could be organic, but what appears to be something like a coordinated campaign to ultimately get Twitter nuked from the Apple App Store, potentially from Android platform phones as well. Uh, in something that would just completely obliterate uh, what was already astounding at the time, the nuking of Parler after the election on January 6th. But before we get to that, just the chronology to sort of how we got here. When Musk took over, he did what I think all of us advocated, which was 
he implemented cuts at the very top of the organization, uh, including the most anti-free speech executives prior to uh, Yoel Roth, the Twitter, I think, safety and integrity head uh, being himself leaving in recent weeks. There's now been uh, indications of massive firings of staff writ large. Uh, Elon Musk has talked about you know, the fact that the, the wokeism that has co corrupted the company, he said that essentially he's going to expose where the bodies were buried in terms of the censorship efforts within the company. Uh, of course, after he proposed some kind of a content moderation panel of experts, diverse experts, uh, which got panned by those and attacked by those on the left and probably the right to some extent as well. He nixed that idea, uh, reinstated Donald Trump, has now said that he is going to have essentially a mass amnesty of arguably wrongfully banned accounts. And now we see that there's an escalation in this effort to say that Twitter is going to unleash a torrent of hate speech, misdis, malinformation, I assume probably stochastic terrorism. Not sure if I've seen that line, that narrative yet, but I'm sure it's coming anytime soon. Uh, Yoel Roth, as I mentioned, sort of indicated that a mechanism to counter Musk in a New York Times article that he wrote after leaving his position uh, was the fact that obviously Twitter is a heavily used mobile app. And so consequently, the app stores themselves have great power over Twitter's ability to exist and thrive. And now you've seen the likes of the Taylor Lorenzes, the media uh, blue check, hall monitors on the one hand, and then also like-minded academics talking about the fact, advocating for, again, Apple and then Android as well to potentially nuke Twitter on top of advertisers fleeing Twitter and mass. So there's kind of a joint campaign I see going on here between all of these people who hate any platform that would dare to abide speech they don't like that challenges their narratives to claim then that it creates not only hate, but then danger to the people implicated. And that therefore, as a matter of national security or public health and safety, the platforms ought to be censored, if not destroyed in and of themselves. And this goes to what I think, you know, the broader kind of meta story has been here from the start. And I argued at Newsweek and elsewhere months back, the whole issue around Twitter is that this is one giant slice of the public square, which our national security agencies and political betters have always wanted to, and in large part have at least effectively controlled, i.e. they've abrogated free speech, the First Amendment by proxy, and now there's a chance that might go away, and they simply cannot tolerate it. And so consequently, you have this full-on assault of information warfare effectively from the media, economic warfare from the advertisers that are pulling out, and we'll see if we have more political warfare in the way of investigations around Musk Twitter, et cetera, as have been threatened before. Again, ironically, on the national security grounds of you know foreign investors in the company uh, and beyond. So I lay all that out there to say there's a whole raft of uh, initiatives that are being undertaken by Musk, I think, for the good inside the company. And I think we'd probably agree for the good. It's exposing this massive counter onslaught, in some ways analogous to the counter Trump onslaught that we saw. Um, and, you know, I think there are positives and negatives of all of this. And I guess the question would be, you know, what do you see ultimately happening with Twitter? Can Musk withstand the kind of whole of ruling class onslaught that's that's coming at him? And by the way, I should also mention he claimed that if he did get nuked, he'd potentially consider creating his own phone and presumably app store as well. So this is the perfect test case study of, you know, can you build your own X, Y, Z? If anyone could do it, I guess Elon Musk is the one to do it. But of course, it's sad that we're in this position in the first place. Yeah, Ben, I, I was just going to jump in there to say in a, a very strange way, you know, Lori Smith and Elon Musk, totally different cases. One is a, you sort of a person in an immense place of privilege um, with literally billions of dollars at his disposal. It is, though, a test case, right? It is like us having to go through this laboratory um, and see whether or not we can still have our freedoms <laughs> and see whether or not we can still sort of make the society work and make American culture work and make American culture healthy. Um, and I think the key to whether Elon Musk can withstand the pressures actually in the one thing you added at the end where you said, well, hey, maybe I'll just make my own phone, um, which is that his you know, seemingly unlimited resources, they aren't actually unlimited, but relatively infinite uh, compared to other people. It's a, a good test case of, of him saying, I'm going to push the boundaries so that the boundaries are pushed for other people. 
um, so that you know there's a an effect on the entire business culture and C-suites across the country that says there's a chunk of the public at least that does not want this and wants the opposite. And I think what he's doing right now, whether or not it's ultimately successful, is proving that. Um, but I think it will ultimately be successful because we all know that market is out there and we all know it's possible to beat this, this stuff back uh, because that's what people want for the most part. So uh, I think, you know, I, I say this every time we talk about Elon Musk and Twitter, the most moral thing to do, the most humane thing to do would be to nuke Twitter from orbit and get it out of our society and out uh, away from our fingertips. Um, but I, I guess, you know, whatever Elon Musk is doing, uh, whether or not it's, I, of course, it's going to be chaotic. I'm hardly like a huge Elon Musk fan. I think he has a lot of problems with his foreign entanglements um, as a businessman. But I don't think that like the chaos disproves that Elon Musk is going to be a, an, a successful steward of Twitter. I think, you know, he always expected that. And if you didn't expect that, you would be absolutely idiotic. So I don't think any of the chaos we're seeing right now um, is an indication he won't be successful. I, I think he probably will, because a lot of this is just an exercise in pushing the boundaries um, for other people to step so, so I, I i'll go ahead rachel go ahead well it's i was just gonna say like on one hand you know i i love the idea of elon musk just being like burn it down i'm building my own phone app store or whatever but on the other hand i almost don't want him to succeed in that measure because i think it like it completely glosses over the fact that the only person that could withstand this kind of structural onslaught is a gajillionaire like Elon Musk. Everybody else is going to be completely wiped out by even a tenth, a fraction, a tiny decimal of what he's up against. And so I think him succeeding here would be great, but all like in, in outside of Twitter and sort of the alternative platforms. But I think it also creates this false notion that just anyone can do that. Right. And you know, you do to Emily's point want to push the boundaries for other people, but I also really have been pushing the right for the last, you know, five years or whatever to recognize that there are that the, there are systemic problems within the institutions that now exist. The fact that Yoel Roth went into the New York Times and openly discussed the two app stores that have a duopoly on app store or on app distribution points that they should crush Twitter because of ideological reasons and they could be successful in doing that is should be a glit, like a flashing red light. I wrote about this way back when Trump put out Truth Social. You know, I said, look, the app stores will ban him and that will be that. You can't actually build your own in this culture because of the way the app stores control access to the marketplace. Everybody on the right was like, ha ha, Rachel's conspiracy theorizing again. Um, but this is the, this is so I like, until we deal with that fact, like I want to cheer Elon Musk on, but I also want us to be able to deal with the fact that structurally we have some systemic problems. So Rachel basically made the point that I was going to make, actually, which is to the extent Sorry. that people no, 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 it, it's a very important point, which is, to, I mean, to the extent that people are kind of feeding Elon Musk with praise as some sort of kind of messianic figure, I mean, he is the panacea, he is like the grand curer of our woes, then that is not only wrong, it, it, it is potentially outright counterproductive insofar as it kind of stops this kind of broader rethinking on these various suite of remedies that we were speaking about in the Microsoft Activision context, whether it's antitrust or Section 230 or common carrier or, or anti-discrimination law or all of the above there. All of those glaring problems remain. And, you know, the idea that we will have these gajillionaires just kind of fly in on these like shiny unicorns from heaven and descend on, uh, you know, onto the earth and they were bought by the companies and saw. No, I, I obviously that's like a fairy tale and that's not how it works. Having said that, having said that, um, you know, I, I do think I am I am cautiously optimistic about the future of Twitter. I mean, to be clear, there are any number of problems. I've seen some accounts get banned that probably shouldn't have been banned. But, you know, I mean, whole President Donald Trump aside for a second, the fact that he's unbanned is obviously, you know, international global news in and of itself. Project Veritas is back on Twitter. I mean, I'm not sure if that's been mentioned yet. I was delighted to see that. I am a, I'm personally a huge Project Veritas fan. I think James O'Keefe is one of the five to 10 most important conservative activists in the entire country. I think he does incredible work. So the fact that Project Veritas is, is back on Twitter is, is a really, really big deal. 
And, you know, if Elon Musk continues his up, I mean, you know, the mere fact that he is that he continues to like reply in the reply section uh, and he, he's engaging, he seems to be kind of taking in feedback. You know, he tried this Twitter blue, buy your own blue check thing. It clearly didn't work with all the impersonations. So he's changing course. I mean, he's, you know, he's following this in real time. He's, he seems to be empirically driven and monitoring it. So I am indeed cautiously optimistic about Twitter under Elon Musk's leadership. But, you know, to Rachel's point, this is obviously not a panacea to our broader structural problems. All right. I think we're going to talk now about uh, what I see, at least, is the biggest story in the world at the moment, uh, which is the the protests that are rocking China, really uh, spreading across cities all over China, not just, you know, one city, not just something small, uh, but protesters all over China chanting, uh, not just, uh, we don't just know this through like Western propaganda, but uh, through videos and through pretty clear evidence, chanting for democracy, chanting for freedom, holding up blank paper paper signs, um, which was used back in the Hong Kong protests. All of this is against China's ongoing, President Xi's ongoing zero COVID policy. Now, she was just re-elected. Re um, it was an election of party officials, and it's you know not really an election of such, uh, to his, his sort of dictator for life status, uh, which I believe is the, the third term. Um, and it looks like his, he's consolidating power as best he can. I've talked to China experts in the past when uh, zero COVID has been protested because there have been sort of cracks in the foundation over the last couple of years in places like Shanghai. And they've said, you know, she actually probably liked this outburst because it's an opportunity for him to crack down and to show that he can successfully crack down on dissent in his country. Um, this time, though, uh, I do think it's probably different because this is becoming widespread. Um, and you can expect the certainly the Western media to, to play it up as much as possible. Um, but the clear reality is that President Xi has a problem on his hands when it comes to zero COVID, um, because there were people that were burned to death in a building that was locked down, that was sealed because of zero COVID recently. Uh, people are being people are fleeing like Foxconn factories, by the way, um, because it's the, the zero COVID makes them stay in one space and lose a whole bunch of freedoms. Um, even if they don't have COVID, even if they haven't had direct contact with somebody who has COVID, their lives are completely upended. And so this leaves a question for she do you do you uh, walk back? a policy that you have made sort of a, uh, a major part of your agenda and that you have clung to and insisted on? Um, or do you cling to and insist on a, uh, on a policy uh, that's going to continue to expose sort of cracks in your consolidation of power, your attempt to consolidate power? Um, or do you continue to sort of abuse human rights and commit human rights abuses in an effort to totally silence the dissent, um, to exert your power in a way that, that hurts human rights uh, and on, on a global scale and then hurts your reputation on a global scale? Um, the economy in China is faltering right now. That's another thing to keep in mind, of course. And the additional, uh, I, I think an additional point I would add is uh, that in the sort of business relationship in the supply chain, for instance, Foxconn, I mentioned, that's where Apple sources a whole bunch of its products. And it's possible that iPhones are not going to be in stock to the level that they need to be for the holiday season because of the, fa the problems with zero COVID at the Foxconn plant in China, this particular Foxconn plant in China. So Xi is now jeopardizing the lucrative business relationships um, via zero COVID. And so that's the point where, you know, you kind of have to decide as the dictator um, what's essential here. Um, and does this create a, a more erratic she that makes a move on Taiwan that ratchets up um, tensions with different maneuvering? So there are a lot of questions to unpack, um, but, you know, we really haven't seen anything like this in mainland China for a very long time. So I, I wanted to open it up to your reactions. Yeah, I think um, the only thing I'll say is that, you know, it's been interesting to watch the level of protests that have come out in China because of the fact that doing so is so dangerous, right? Doing, be, taking, actually protesting in China has legitimately d bad consequences um, in terms of jail, in terms of having your whole life upended. So the fact that people, that many people are willing to do it so aggressively tells you how bad the problem is. 
and tells you there's probably, you know, a very serious uh, undercurrent uh, rippling under the surface uh, in terms of, you know, national outrage uh, as it relates to this. Um, but the second thing I would say that's sort of tangential is, you know, it's to the point you made about the iPhones, any other company would probably pull up stakes in China, right? <laughs> and yet Apple is has, as we know, deals upon deals cut with the Chinese government in which, you know, it has preferred treatment in exchange for helping China develop technologies. Um, Microsoft, which I mentioned actually earlier in my segment, has also helped China build a surveillance uh, system designed for a time such as this, right? Designed to identify and suppress dissidents. So uh, there is an element of our, you know, our own companies helping the crackdown, <clears throat> which I think is shameful. Yeah, so um, just just a couple points. I mean, first of all, it is worth emphasizing that the seemingly the starting point for this conflagration of uh, of protests, which are widespread and throughout China, particularly in major cities, and also, by the way, have started to take on uh, not just an anti-lockdown, draconian, putatively COVID-associated set of policies, but anti-Xi Jinping and anti-Chinese Communist Party themselves kind of character, which is very significant, is the fact that what started all of this ostensibly, again, was this building essentially being welded shut and people dying in a fire within it as a consequence of these policies. I think that perfectly symbolizes the policies that our betters in the West, by the way, embraced for months on end in large part, uh, which is one of the, the more sickening aspects of the Chinese coronavirus response is that we embraced effectively the same policies that China was amplifying and propagating out to the world as the proper responses, which I've argued at length is one of the reasons why the kind of complicity of the West partnering with China with respect to the Chinese coronavirus. And of course, when we go back to the origins of it, why there has been no you know, truth and reconciliation and accountability committee to actually hold people to account and their feet to the fire over what's transpired, because everyone is sort of complicit in this, but to different degrees. And of course, China is the most complicit. They've been the most draconian and tyrannical with the lockdown measures. I think this shows once again that under the guise of public health and safety, governments, regimes will take on all sorts of authoritarian, tyrannical powers to exploit those tragedies. Uh, but all that said, to the extent these uprisings do continue to spread and people feel more emboldened within China, we'll have to get a sense over time, I guess, as to how widespread the anti-regime sentiment is. Maybe from Xi's perspective, this these protests are going to kind of smoke out who the potential threats are to the CCP and thus ought to be taken out. We don't know how organized they are, who might be behind them, including perhaps Xi's rivals within the CCP. Um, I, I, I'm very cautiously optimistic about how strong the anti-CCP sentiment is in the country, uh, because there has been polling, which however manipulated and faulty it would be, has indicated historically, at least, you know, in theory, when the economy was relatively sound, and this is all you know, layering in and discounting for the propaganda associated with these exercises, but that the Chinese people have been relatively okay with the CCP in power. To the extent this is really widespread and it does lead to potentially an existential threat for the regime, it's going to get very gory, I suspect, on the streets there. And there's going to be a question then of what is the West response, if any, to it. Um, I, I know what I would be betting on with respect to Joe Biden, which is that he's a compromised figure and whatever you think about what the U.S. role should be to the extent there's a chance that the CCP could be toppled or she could be toppled, uh, questions are going to start arising to the extent the anti-CCP sentiment grows here. So these are all things to watch. And the last thing I'll point out is the silence of the administration, uh, all of the West's leading companies with respect to both what's going on in China and what's been going on in Iran, I think is quite deafening and telling about where they've put their chips down, which is to say they've sided with the regimes against the peoples in these places. For decades, they've been literally and figuratively invested in it. And it, of course, exposes how hollow, weak, and disingenuous the woke veneer truly is. So just two quick points, because I agree with the thrust of what has been said so far. So one is I want to basically just accentuate what Ben just said, which is kind of drawing the line from what's happening 
in China recently to what's been happening in Iran since September or so, completely holding aside what the proper U.S. role should be in any kind of given country or any kind of foreign intervention or whatnot, it is, you know, it, it should be here or there and everywhere, at least encouraging to see kind of the human spirit trying to fight up against what can only be described as truly totalitarian regimes and kind of just give you an idea of, you know, how totalitarian the Chinese Communist Party was. You know, earlier this year in Shanghai, which is the most populous city um, in, in, in all of China, you know, uh, they literally had sirens blaring throughout the city. Um, and I, 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 don't remember, I don't know if I remember the exact quote verbatim. I think I, I think I can get it very close to verbatim, to, to verbatim at least. And the sirens said, uh, this is when the people were literally locked down, not, a, not allowed to leave because of this ridiculous and absurd zero COVID policy that China and Xi Jinping have had. The, the sirens blaring said, control your soul's inner desire for freedom. Um, I mean, that's like pretty straight out of George Orwell stuff <laughs> to, you know, to lock down 20, 30, however many million people and to have these sirens blaring to people and like uh, in, in their apartment buildings uh, to hearing that that's, that's pretty awful stuff. And it's really just a final, this is the final point I'll make. It really is just kind of a reminder of, of, of the old Rahm Emanuel quip of never letting a good crisis go to waste. Right. I mean, that's really all Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy has been since day one. Uh, I mean, you know, hold aside whether it was, Prudence when we knew nothing about the virus in those first five, 10 days, whenever, you know, everyone got kind of leeway for a couple of weeks there. But, you know, at this point, two, two and a half years after, um, you know, you know, the, the the pandemic started, there is literally no justification for quote unquote zero COVID whatsoever, full stop period, end of story, other than just kind of reifying the quintessence of Rahm Emanuel's quip about never letting a good crisis go to waste, because that is the modus operandi of the communist month. Yeah, and, and as we transition to final thoughts, I'll just add Gordon Chang made an interesting point um, that this is one of the most, he, he said it was more significant than Tiananmen Square because the difference then is um, that, that people were sort of protesting the excesses of the regime, whereas now people, but generally wanted the regime to stay put, whereas now it's possible that people um, are actually supportive of a, a different kind of government um, in China. So we'll see whether that pans, to, pans out. Um, and, you know, the likelihood of she being toppled, as Ben mentioned, uh, it feels, you know, sort of depressingly, depressingly low, um, and the alternative might not be much better. So with that, I'll, I'll see if anyone has final thoughts. Um, I could start with final thoughts. I just wanted to um, <laughs> return to the my black pill from last week, which I'm still black pilling on, which is the Respect for Marriage Act that's going on um, in the, the vote that's going on in the Senate. And the reason, as I discussed last week and I touched on this week, is because of just the wide open lane it creates for harassment of individuals by their government for having cultural culturally dissenting views. But I want to add uh, to that uh, and maybe, maybe this is a coda of, you know, sort of the post midterm analysis that we all did, but there's also news uh, gurgling over the last couple of days that Republicans in the Senate are now working on a, to, trying to make a, um, an amnesty deal happen as well, um, using a uh, ag worker bill to push forward some um, amnesty with, you know, of course, limited border security, um, if any at all. And the point I'm, I think that should not be lost here is that all these Republicans just performed exceptionally poorly, underperformed expectations in the midterms. And the first thing they do when they get back is they vote to toss religiously minded conservatives to the wolves and say, oh, maybe we should do an amnesty deal during the worst border crisis in American history. All of the recriminations and finger pointing that have been going on about candidate selection, about movement of resources, about get out the vote, overlooks the fact that this kind of voting behavior probably turn go, t goes toward depressing turnout more than anything, any of those three things I just mentioned. So until people, the Republicans in DC, get their mind right about actually representing their voters and not, you know, whatever ferried interest, corporate interests that are pushing them uh, in, in DC, we're going to continue to have midterm expectations like what we just saw. So that is just my rant that I had to get off my chest. So that is my final thought. So I'll be really brief. I was contemplating this week talking about this deposition of Anthony Fauci that occurred recently, and uh, I'd urge everyone to check out the limited reporting that has arisen 
around this deposition, which comes in what I think is one of the most remarkable lawsuits, unheralded triumphs that we've seen, which is this lawsuit brought by uh, now uh, soon to be senator, I guess, from Missouri, Eric Schmidt, uh, as well as Louisiana's attorney general, where they have exposed essentially the collusion, the coordination, co-optation, uh, co-option rather, between the national security apparatus, largely the Biden administration, and big tech companies writ large, and how essentially through COVID, again, the exploitation of the pandemic, they foisted on Americans this whole censorship apparatus uh, that we continue to labor under today. And that, as we discussed, you know, Elon Musk, it seems at least, is trying to fight back against. The deposition, for the, from what I've seen in the reporting, is kind of remarkable that essentially Anthony Fauci, the most ubiquitous man in the American government, basically says he knew nothing about a whole slew of majorly important issues that he was going on Sunday shows and every other program talking about for several years. Um, so it's interesting to see him seem to have selective amnesia when it comes in a deposition around this massive public-private censorship case. Uh, but I do want to say that it is worth, I think, appreciating this lawsuit for what it has exposed. Uh, it'll be interesting to compare what this lawsuit ultimately exposes about the nature, size, scope, extent of the First Amendment violations by proxy here, and then what a House controlled by Republicans does as well. You you should be able to beat this lawsuit standard, uh, but let's see. So on the pandemic note, I'll make my also brief final thought. Um, so we have another op-ed in Newsweek up this week from Senator Marco Rubio on pharmaceutical supply chains, and it's in the context of the spread of RSV, the respiratory virus, and how there's actually a current shortage of amoxicillin, which is one of the most ubiquitous antibiotics across uh, across the entire country, for that matter. So the point of Senator Rubio's op-ed, which I think is well taken, is that here we are, you know, we're two and a half years after COVID broke out. And we all kind of remember those early days of the pandemic when it seemed like China, um, you know, had this sort of this sort of Damocles of sorts kind of hovering over the heads of the United States. They controlled basically all the PPE, all this various stuff that the hospitals that were, um, you know, uh, veering towards overload capacity in those first couple of weeks. China, it was very much a wake up call, I think, or at least it should have been for many people that the kind of the globalization, neoliberalism, and the fact that the United States has made very willful and deliberate decisions to kind of let the chips fall where they may, even if that means kind of uprooting entire, entire supply chains, manufacturing capacity, shipping them overseas, even to a very hostile power, even to, as the case may be, our preeminent geopolitical arch foe, um, the People's Republic of China. I, you know, many people should have seen that that this was completely unsustainable. I mean, not nearly is it beneath the dignity of uh, of one of the greatest nations in the world, the greatest nation in the world, the United States. It is frankly kind of a recipe for what Hayek would call the road to serfdom and ultimately kind of civilizational suicide. Um, and the very kind of clear and stark point of Senator Rubio's brief op-ed for us in Newsweek this week is to just explicitly say that we haven't learned it yet. Um, you know, whatever we thought we we realized then back in March and April 2020 about the need to kind of reshore or ally shore or near shore, as some of the trade policy people say, um, you know, even if you're not bringing the supply chains back to the United States for X, Y, Z labor reasons, you, you know, you could at least bring it back to the Western Hemisphere. Mexico um, is, it has has emerged as a particularly appealing place for various reasons. Gordon Chang actually wrote a, wrote a piece about us for Newsweek on that specific topic of kind of manufacturing moving, moving from China to Mexico in particular. But man, when it comes to pharmaceuticals, Senator Rubio says, apparently we have simply not done enough yet. And that's pretty troubling, obviously. It's terrifying, and it's actually a great segue into the final thought I was going to share, which is basically uh, picking up on the point we were discussing in the first segment um, about whether a lot of this stuff is trickling into the official Republican Party, because Senator Rubio is a good example of somebody who has absolutely been ahead of the curve and has has taken a lot of flack for it, um, especially from you know the, the never Trump types um, over the course of the last several years for his, uh, I, I think, argumentation in favor of uh, particular industrial policies or against the old consensus and against the conservative status quo. Um, and, you know, Josh was absolutely right to point out that there were conservatives who supported Lena Khan 
Um, and we're having these conversations here as you know, proof positive that there is change afoot. Um, I don't want to speak for the group, but I think all of us, you know, maybe five years ago would have sounded a little bit different and maybe not entirely different, but a little bit different on some of these topics because maybe our priorities would have been different. I shouldn't say five years ago, 10 years ago, um, because maybe our priorities would have been different when it comes to the economy or when it comes to foreign policy or wherever it is. Um, what continues to be depressing, though, is if we think about, you know, the idea that Mitch McConnell may have uh, suffered some pushback against him being reelected as a Senate minority leader. True. But what was so depressing is what's the other option, right? Who's who's on the bench behind Mitch McConnell? Well, it's a whole lot of people that still have a whole lot of power here in Washington, D.C., who don't want to hear a damn word about Lena Khan, um, who don't want to hear a word. We were upset with Kevin McCarthy's very obvious point about not sending a blank check to Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's just they don't want to hear a word against the status quo or against the consensus. Um, and they are unwilling, entirely unwilling, to think creatively at all um, about any of these problems. And creatively doesn't mean liberally or progressively. Uh, it means creatively. So I, I think that's what's really kind of depressing is we can talk to we're blue in the face, and we should, and we do, um, uh, about you know new ideas and uh, the problems with the old ideas. Um, but I, I continue, I, I think the jury is still out, um, especially, you know, after some, you know, disappointing results in the midterms when it comes to like Blake Masters, someone I think a lot of us would have liked to see in the Senate. Um, you know, that, that's not to say it's all bad news. It's just to say uh, the Republican Party is changing, but it hasn't fundamentally changed. Um, and that's my pessimistic final thought. But on behalf of uh, Rachel, Ben, and Josh, thank you so much for tuning in to NatCon Squad. I'm Emily Jashinsky, um, and we'll be back with more Mac NatCon Squad next week.